righty, we were ready to begin our regularly scheduled uh, voting meeting. So we'll start off as always with uh, roll call, please. Mr. Foos. Here. Ms. Nyman. Here. Mr. Brees. Here. Mr. Lewis. Here. Mrs. Usavage. Here. Mrs. Denon. Here. Mr. Boyer. Here. Ms. Duroff. Present. Mr. Elsier. Here. Okay, we now have a Pledge of Allegiance followed by a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Right, that should be. Okay, thank you. Okay, we now have a uh, short uh, PSBA certificate of appreciation. Actually, this, uh, Mr. President, recognition was hand delivered, and it was actually uh, a recognition for you. Uh, PSBA, the Board of uh, Directors for the Pennsylvania School Board Association, uh, proudly presents a certificate of appreciation. Uh, to school director Stephen L. Sear for Boyertown Area School District for eight years of school board service. So congratulations, Mr. L. Sear. Thank you. Wow. Okay, did not know that was coming. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, we have a welcome by uh, Dr. Wayne Foley, our high school principal. Thank you very much. We appreciate the opportunity to uh, welcome everyone here tonight and a, a great opportunity for us to be able to celebrate our students. And in particular this evening, we like to be able to celebrate our student athletes from this fall sports. So at this time, I'm gonna ask uh, Athletic Di Director of Athletics, Mr. Palladino to come to the mic and let's get uh, introducing some of our students. Thank you, Dr. Foley. Any student athlete we have in here right now, would you please stand up? The fall of 2019 was a season of success for the student athletes in the Boyertown School District. There were many league, district, and state accomplishments, both individually and as a team. Dr. Foley and I would like to take this opportunity to thank our booster clubs who contributed meals to our teams on our way to district and state playoff games. This would not have been possible without them. Our booster and parent, parent clubs go above and beyond providing meals and accommodations for our student athletes which our district cannot provide. Golf team members, John Engel and Kylie Wood, were qualifiers for PIAA District 1 and state tournaments. The cross country team had numerous district qualifiers. Christian McComb qualified and represented Boyertown in the PIAA championship race. In only their third year of competition, our girls volleyball team finished second in the Pioneer Athletic Conference and sixth in PIAA District 1. They were only one game shy of qualifying for the state tournament. The boys soccer team, under direction of Coach Mark Chambers, had the most successful season in the history of the boys program with a record of 22-3-2. They were Pioneer Athletic Conference champions, PIAA District 1 runners-up, and PIAA championship semifinalists. The girls soccer team, under direction of Coach Bill Goddard, also had the most successful season in the history of the girls program with a record of 27-2. They were Pioneer Athletic Conference champions, PIAA District 1 runners-up, and the PIAA 4A state champions. Coach Goddard has also been named Pennsylvania 4A Girls Soccer Coach of the Year. Our department has volunteers like Ross Smith, who wake up every morning at 4 a.m. to take care of our social media pages. 
The work he does is invaluable. During the girls' soccer championship game, our social media pages had 142,267 views and clicks. He single-handedly keeps Boyertown informed. In the past five years, Boyertown has had numerous league champions, district champions. Wrestling was a PIAA state runner-up. We were state champions in baseball, girls basketball, and this year, girls soccer. The amount of success our student athletes have achieved over the past five years has not happened anywhere else in the state. Most schools never earn a state championship. We have numerous. Coaches and student athletes from every sport and activity come out to support each other. Just two weeks ago, we had coaches and students cancel their personal plans, change work schedules, and sit through the freezing cold just to be there for our student athletes. This shows the commitment our coaches and students have for each other. Don't wait for a championship to happen to support these students. Support them all the time. We really have something special going on here right now. We are truly one Boyer town. Hey, Maddie Gallagher, hold up that trophy. Okay, students, you guys can sit down. Just want to do a brief overview of what we do for when we have a state championship recognition. Each in the last five years that we've had, we've tried to do the exact same thing for every team. Some timelines are a bit skewed depending on if it's in the spring, because those state championships happen really after graduation into the summer. Fall and winter are a little bit easier. This one thing that we do do, coming back into town, police, ambulance, and fire personnel give us an escort back in, usually from like say Dan's Deli up on 73, all the way into town with sirens blaring. If you've never experienced that, it's awesome. Being on the bus with those kids, that's when it really hits them that they did something. It's when, when the sirens are blaring and the community was outstanding along the streets, cheering us on, coming back in, it was just an awesome thing. Then when we get back here, we usually hold a pep rally in the gym for people who can't make it up to the game. They usually meet us back here. We had numerous student athletes, coaches, teachers, community members who met us back here that night, and that was awesome. We usually do some type, some type of team store for state championship apparel. We do a, a team championship photo where we have it with, with the trophy and the medals, and then we create, we get plaques done that we can give to a keepsake for those kids. And we also get numerous recognitions from community members or state representatives. On December 18th, uh, girls soccer team were going up, representatives Maloney and Topol have invited us up to Harrisburg, so we get a tour of the house, uh, and we get this, they get citations, everything like that, we're on the floor that day. Parades haven't really been in the mix. Dr. Foley and I have contacted our, our local uh, township and borough to speak about that. We would need numerous local and PennDOT permits which have to be obtained. They told us also the amount of law enforcement and fire police which would need to be scheduled would be very hard for them to do and also shutting down those streets for that amount of time. So one of the things we will do, like we've done in the past, when we have their championship banner ready, which should be in a few weeks. We usually hold a ceremony, say before or a halftime of a basketball game, where we can invite everybody who wants to recognize these students. They can come back out to a game and we can raise the banner and have the banner raising ceremony so everybody can feel involved and be involved if you couldn't be there that night. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our presentation. We I uh, appreciate you celebrating our students. Have a good evening. Okay, that's fantastic. Great news for Boyertown. Uh, next up, a previous executive session announcement. So on November 12th, uh, 2019, uh, the board met in executive session for 80 minutes regarding legal and personnel. And uh, this evening, we met as well for approximately 40 minutes uh, for legal 
and uh, union negotiations. So with that, uh, before we go to public comment period number one, uh, we have a couple updates that I believe it's important to make the community aware uh, as uh, one, they're on the uh, itemized agenda for a vote. Uh, one is the, uh, the union contract, the other is the potential closure of Pine Forge Elementary School. Uh, so we do have a short update on, uh, on the potential closure, but I want to start off with a statement, uh, and I will say, unfortunately, it's not necessarily brief, but uh, bear with me, as I think it's important uh, for the work that was done on the, uh, the teacher's contract uh, to go through this statement. So as president of the board of directors, I am pleased to announce that after a lengthy negotiation process, the Boyertown Area School District, BASD, and the Boyertown Area Education Association, known as the BAEA, which represents our teaching staff, have reached a tentative agreement that once approved will establish a multi-year agreement that extends through the 2022 and 2023 school year. Our goal has been to maintain the excellent educational experience we provide to our students by our for offering market competitive salaries and benefits that are fiscally sustainable and consistent with the state mandated adjusted Act 1 index that is set by the state at approximately 3.1% for example, for fiscal year 2020-2021. Our administrative team have evaluated the tentative agreement and have informed the board that it will be fiscally sustainable only as long as this board and future boards annually raise taxes to the adjusted Act 1 index, as well as prudently control and or reduce operating expenditures, such as the closure of Pine Forge Elementary School. This board has had to make some tough and emotional decisions over the past few years. And this is to address our structural deficit while maintaining our quality education programs and also being responsible to all citizens and taxpayers. We want to thank the association and the administration for their efforts in working together on this agreement. The four year, four year deal represents, or pre, I'm sorry, presents a, a collective compromise by all parties to reach consensus as to what is in the best interest of the students and the district during our current fiscal challenges. I believe this agreement will help keep us focused on upholding the district's new vision to cultivate an exceptional, innovative learning community that enables all students to succeed in a changing world. So here are some financial highlights of the four-year agreement uh, that, that's part of the four-year agreement, but it is not limited to the following items. So first piece, salary. In year one of the agreement, BAEA members will receive a $250 on-scale increase effective as of the 14th pay of the school year, plus column movement, but no step movement. This equates to approximately a 0.2% pay increase. In other words, two tenths of 1%. In year two, effective as the first pay of the school year, BAEA members would receive a $750 on scale increase, plus one step and one column movement. This represents an overall 3.15 projected pay increase. In year three, effective as of the first pay of the school year, 2% would be added to the salary schedule plus one column movement. This represents an anticipated 2% pay increase. In year four, effective as of the first pay of the school year, BAEA members would receive a $750 on-scale increase plus step and one column movement. This represents an approximate overall 3.02% increase. In the area of tuition reimbursement, for the co-curricular salary, there will be a 2% increase on scale for each year of the agreement. 
effective for all tuition reimbursement requests made on or after July 1st of 2020, the BAEA member must be enrolled in a pre-approved first or second master's degree program, a doctoral program, or a program leading to a certification pre-approved by the superintendent or their designee. Random courses taken prior to July 1st, 2020 will be eligible for tuition reimbursement and column movement, but any unused credits or previously used credits could not be used again for column movement following June 30th of 2020. Following July 1st of 2020, random courses that are not part of the pre-approved first or second year master's degree program or pre-approved certification program or pre-approved doctoral program will no longer be eligible for either tuition reimbursement or column movement. Effective July 1st of 2020, bargaining unit members shall not be eligible to receive more than one column movement per contract school year. Effective on or after the ratification date of the collective bargaining agreement, the homebound instruction and professional rate will be $37 per hour. In the area of long-term substitutes, effective July 1st of 2020, the pay rate for the long-term professional substitutes will be increased to bachelor step one rate, which is uh, approximately over $50,000 in the collective bargaining agreement. Additional, or uh, sorry, educational attainment and years of service will not be recognized for long-term professional substitutes. Also effective July 1st of 2020, the long-term professional substitute compensation for the new teacher academy and professional development days would be included in the long-term professional substitute salary rate as an employee obligation. In regards to our pre-K counts, those employees will now receive the same contractual benefits as all of all other bargaining unit members and the bachelor step one pay, current, again, currently over $50,000 or around $50,000, but will not be eligible for salary step increases under the collective bargaining agreement and educational attainment will not be recognized. There will be four professional IEP, which is individual education plan writing days, will be provided to special education professional staff members annually based upon a, a new approved schedule by the special education professional staff's supervisor. Now some highlights of the medical plan. The district will continue to offer three medical plans, Premier, Deluxe, and the value plan, which include a prescription drug with an actuarial value of gold, which is 80 to 90 percent, or platinum, 90 to 100 percent. The actual variable uh, value represents the percentage of total average costs for covered benefits that a plan will cover. Vision and dental plans remain the same. Healthcare benefits during this school year, 2019-2020, will remain unchanged in the first year of the agreement with premium shares and plan design changes in the subsequent years as set forth here. Effective July 1st, 2020, the 91.2% .2 actuarial value premium plan share will give 14% premium share paid by the BAEA member. Also effective July 1st of 2020, the premier plan's deductibles, currently at 350 single and 700 family, will be modified to 500 for single coverage and $1,000 deductible for family coverage. Also effective July 1st in 2020, in regards to the uh, deluxe plan, the valued deluxe plan, which is at an 88.1% actuarial value, will eliminate the 10% coinsurance provision and the deluxe plans deductibles currently at 500 for single and 1,000 for family <clears throat> will be modified to 1,000 for single and 2,000 for family coverage. The deluxe plan premium share shall remain at 6% paid by the BAEA member for the term of the collective bargaining agreement. And this is to, in order to encourage employees to elect this plan. 
the 81.8% actual variable value plan premium share shall remain at 10% covered by the district for the term of the collective bargaining agreement, again, to, in order to encourage more employees to elect this plan. The dental plan is fully covered by the school district. The vision plan is fully covered by the school district for single coverage. And premium share for family coverage is less than $2 a month. This agreement is the result of both parties' collaboration and responsiveness to the challenging fiscal status of the district. In analyzing the increasingly competitive marketplace for high quality teachers, this agreement should also continue to aid in the recruitment and retention of excellent teachers for our school district. According to the data provided by the BCIU and reviewed by the district prior to this agreement being reached, Boyertown is one of the top three school districts in highest average salary for, for professional staff in the county. This new agreement should help maintain that status while reducing the trajectory of increases that we have experienced in past agreements. As stated earlier, we, have, we are faced with some difficult decisions to address the structural defi deficiencies in our budget. This agreement is sustainable and our projected budgetary deficit will be significantly reduced, if not eliminated, as long as this board and future board members commit to taxing to the adjust, adjusted Act 1 index, Act 1 index and control and or reduce expenditures, such as the closure of Pine Forge Elementary School. We cannot continue to drain our fund balance, nor do we have the ability to make several millions of dollars of cuts without the potential of reducing staff and significant program curtailment or even elimination. The proposed actions coming before us will, ha will help allow us to protect the quality school district while also pre preparing to address much needed issues as student counselor ratios, to name just one. Again, I'd like to thank the association and the administration for their efforts in collaboration and commitment to doing what is in the best interest of the students and the district. We also want to thank the parents and guardians and the community for their continued support in investing in our students and the district. Together, we will continue to work towards upholding our district's new vision to cultivate an exceptional, innovative learning community that enables all students to succeed in a changing world. So again, I thought it was important to lay that out right out there uh, in the spirit of transparency for our public, our community. Uh, we now have a uh, short update, I believe, on uh, Pine Forge, correct? All right. We need to switch over to the, switch back over to the board docs. Mr. President and board members, as I get started, we'd like to invite, invite uh, uh, Mr. Bill Montgomery and Tim Lambert, are they here, to come up to the chair. As they come up to the chair, um, we would like to uh, give a little summary of where things are. As you remember, that we, uh, when we took the, upon this process, uh, the goal that was given to me was to develop a plan for the effective use of school facilities uh, to support teaching and learning. The task at the time was to provide the school board with elementary and middle school enrollment and demographic study, along with possible recommendations for the effective use of our schools using all 10 and or nine buildings. Uh, the board, as you know, adopted scenario one and then adopted a proposal to move forward in consideration of scenario two. Key project goals and parameters with the use of the facilities to be more uh, efficient with a percentage of utilization ranging anywhere between 90 to 100 percent, but to be more effective, the use of the school facility to support educational programs and to be more equitable having a school facility that, that are healthy, safe, educationally appropriate, environmentally sustainable, and accessible 
no matter the wealth of the families in the community. We attempted to move the gray areas, minimize as best as possible the percentage of students who were impacted. Uh, we also were tasked with providing the board with an updated student enrollment projections and analysis uh, to balance as best can the middle school enrollment while also considering future growth. Also the effort to improve and balance elementary school enrollment and allow for future considerations. Uh, we were also tasked with eliminating, if possible, to split middle school feeder patterns, which we did accomplish, uh, to prepare for increase, uh, a plan for K-12 enrollment possibilities, to create better school-to-school -school feeder patterns, and create a logical and geographical plan areas, which you were presented what they call MPUs, and to provide an assessment of future growth. Growth. What you will see um, is an update being provided by uh, Mr. Montgomery and Tim Lambert. Uh, when you adopted scenario one uh, and it gave a direction to move forward with the consideration for scenario two, uh, we indicated to the board that we would take the current year's enrollment that we turned into the State Department of Education, use that information as well as information taken from any new data that we would get from the townships to update the information that you had previously received so that you could see the current projected impact. It is important and a reminder that I will ask that the board uh, remember that when we say projections, we're talking about projections that are at least five years out. This task that we're under facing now, it comes with a recommendation that the board of school directors approve scenario two resulting in the closure of Pine Forge Elementary School, or according to section 13-131A of the Public School Code of 1949, and according to section 13-1311A, the School Code of 1949, which states, the Board of School Directors of any school district may, on account of the small number of pupils in attendance, or the condition of the existing school building, or for the purpose of better graduation and classification, or other reasons, such as effective use of the buildings to support teaching and learning, close any one or more of the public schools in this district. Upon such school or schools being closed, the pupils who belong to that same shall be assigned to other schools, and upon cause shown, be permitted to attend schools and other locations in the district. The recommendation is based in part upon the following. The projected outcomes show that we would have a balanced building utilization, capacity versus enrollment within a targeted range, effective and efficient use of resources. Reasons for the potential closure are declining enrollment over time, age and repair costs of the facility, and other reasons, which were presented again at the hearing that was required, redirecting staff resources to vacant positions, the reduction in district FTE count, the redirection of fiscal resources to other nine schools, and the opportunity to acquire year after year savings to address a structural deficiency in the BASD budget. As indicated by Mr. L. Steele's statement, the board previously received a presentation that showed that even going to the adjusted Act 1 index over the next few years, we would continue to have a deficit of, of ranging from 1.8 million rising to $2 million, going from an a initial of 800 and roughly $50,000 to a cumulative def, def, a deficit of $6.5 million. The board was also provided a fiscal analysis showing the impact of implementing the Adjusted Act 1 index as well as the closure of Pine Forge as requested. That anal analysis showed that the district would move from a rough $850,000 deficit to a surplus in each of the next three years of roughly $800,000 on average. While that sounds significant, I would caution the board that that is not, but it is on the black side. I remind the school board that we received a 
in improvement in our bond rating based on the corrective actions we've taken this past year and was very clearly stated that failure to continue these actions would result in our bond rating being downgraded. We were also indicated that our debt is considered moderate to low at only 5.5%. Any time that you have less than 1% to 2% remaining in your budget, you're dangerously close to overspending your budget. Best business practices is to have at least 98 to 99% of your budget spent and at least 1% available. So even though this would move us into positive, we would not be out of the water and need to continue to do our due diligence and do work. At this time, I would like to introduce Mr. Bill Montgomery and Tim Lambert, who will provide you an update on their analysis based on the new numbers we received uh, this year, additionally being able to account for kindergarten enrollment once it showed up, and also they will share with you the recent information they received and the developments that are happening around the district. I will share with you just as a record of note that if someone currently goes look at the Pennsylvania Department of Education website, that website will show that we actually as a district have declining enrollment. The difference you will find is that they have not been able to do what we hired them to do yet. They go by projections. But their projections show that we would be declining, have been declining over the past few years in enrollment. So at this time, uh, Bill. Good evening. Um, and thank you for again welcoming us back. Uh, the superintendent had asked that we would do an overlay, take a look at last year's uh, enrollment numbers, which were 2018, 2019, and those numbers come in about approximately the middle of October, and compare them with the numbers that we have this year, 2019, 2020. Uh, and that scenario comparison, some we did that Tim will present. Um, regarding the developments, um, we've spoken about them on a number of occasions. The last time I think we were here were in March. We had about 26 developments throughout the uh, townships, and that's still about the same. 25 is the actual number right now. Some developments came on a little bit sooner and, a little, and selling a little bit faster. Some have actually been pushed back, and we made that adjustment so that you will see them in the upcoming numbers. Uh, we took a look at some uh, development work that Mr. Lewis did, and thank you for that, it was appreciated. Uh, and I think what you had stated, Dr. Dr. Benton, is that those numbers did not, I assume they did not have the new development numbers in them. But the, uh, the numbers you showed us were pretty much, at, were, were accurate to what we expected would be if they, there wasn't the kind of growth that we're seeing. The growth is moving along at kind of the pace we expected. Um, houses have to, first they have to clear the land, then they have to build the homes. They sell the homes while they're being built, which doesn't necessarily mean they went to settlement. And we go by sales. We'll talk to the owners and developers and find out how many homes have sold. And then we'll cross-reference that with the township managers, but they only get it basically once a year as to how many settlements they actually had. Board so, members, this document is actually on your board docs. And it's in public view for anyone who wants to log in in the public. So the sales are happening, the settlements are happening. Uh, there was a downturn a little bit in the spring. Uh, assuming with the interest rate drop, there's been a little bit of an uptick in the fall going into where we are right now. Uh, I can address any of the developments direct, uh, specifically if, if that's what you wish, but I'll turn it over now to, to Mr. Lambert, to Tim, and he can run down the cross-reference between last year and this year in the scenarios. Excuse me. Good evening. Uh, my name is Tim Lambert. Uh, I'll walk you through the document that you see up on the board. Um, so when we do projections, we're not just looking at the trending of, you know, one year over the other, although that's obviously a major um, impact in your projections, but we're also looking at, uh, as Ms. Montgomery pointed out, the developments. 
um, because they provide a significant um, change to your trending, uh, where you know a new development of a hundred homes may actually switch the trend of a school from negative to positive. Um, and we'll see in a lot of new developments that you're going to have a lot of newer, uh, younger families with young students um, that will either have student, uh, student aid or school age students uh, moving in or being there in the next couple years. And we use both industry standard um, rates on how many uh, students we can expect per the number of units as well as looking at uh, the history of Boyertown school district's developments um, itself. So if the development was um, created a couple years ago, we can see how many students we're getting from that type of a development based on the cost of the home, the number of bedrooms, and where it's located, and the amenities in the area. So with that in mind, there's um, essentially three different views we're going to show. The, the first one that you see up on the board is the existing catchments. So um, what the one thing I need to state is what we're looking at per numbers is the number of students who live in those catchments, not the number of students who attend the school. So for example, you could live in the Gilbertsville Elementary School catchment but attend New Hanover or attend Boyertown. Um, so what we're doing is we're actually looking at the projections at the demographic level of where those students actually live, not where they go to school. Because ultimately we, you know, we want to make sure that we have space in a school when you're in that catchment. So this, the, the green chart here is, and this will be significant or the same for each page is, the top part is looking at your current enrollment. So your current enrollment um, and where those students live is in that top section. And you'll see the utilization rate is based off of the building capacity and the total number of students. So you would take the total number of students, divide that by the capacity, and there, that's how you get the utilization. Our analysis from last year is located to the right of that, showing what, we, um, what the analysis was last year. So right off the bat, you can see that Gilbertsville grew. Um, it was at 116% utilization last year. Now it's at 126% utilization. Um, that's a significant growth, obviously. Um, and then you see a lot of the, a lot of the schools in the, um, the west side of the school district saw a decrease, while the ones on the east side of the school district saw an increase, um, as expected, because that's where the majority of the development is being uh, undertaken. So the, the part below it is the projection five years from now. So that takes into account both the trending of the schools as well as the developments themselves. And the way trending works is it, it's a weighted value, but it takes the more recent years and uses that as a more weighted value. So if you lost 10% um, of your students in the last year and then maybe only 1% in the two previous years, it's going to weigh that 10% a little bit more. So it's going to show a, a slightly faster decline than, than you, we, we would have seen last year. Um, and the one thing that did point out is Washington actually increased uh, more so than we expected. So, and anything you see here will most likely be, you'll see propagated into the different scenarios. Because ultimately the scenarios didn't change a, a significant no amount of your boundaries. Uh, basically the scenario one that was approved uh, adjusted the Gilbertsville boundary essentially, um, as well as the, the gray areas. So. Um, as you can see, the one thing you want to point out there is Gilbertsville in five years from now would be upwards to about 142 percent if we were to use the students who live in the catchment. Um, obviously, you cannot have 142 percent in the building. You know, there's just not enough room uh, with, you know, 700 and we're expecting upwards to almost 1,000 in that in that actual catchment. And you guys made the decision to, to change that so we, we don't have that situation moving forward. So going to uh, slide two, um, these were the approved catchment changes. And uh, for the most part, uh, they're, they're, they're in line of what we expected. Um, and I won't go into too much detail, but there are a few points I do want to make. You'll see down there, New Hanover, where we expected at 95% is now at 102%. And the main cause for that is a development which got, it looks like it may start a little bit sooner than we originally expected. And that development has 800, well, originally at 861 units. 
it actually got moved down to 641, but that's 641 new homes in the New Hanover um, catchment. Uh, it's called the Marinara, Marinara, Marinara. Marinara track. They, they've also, just for reference, it's now called uh, Meadows, something, it's not Rolling Meadows, it's uh, Hanover Meadows, they're calling it. So you might hear it that or Marinari. So that, that's the largest change that we see. And again, these are, um, this is based on data provided to us by the different townships. So this is something that you want to keep track of because we're still looking at maybe a year or two before they actually start the development and we're looking five years down the road. So if, you know, they, they could be pushing forward, they could push back. So this is really something that you say, oh, the numbers in five years don't match. A lot of that has to do with how the developments are actually progressing. Um, and it's relatively, you know, straightforward. You can actually see construction. Um, a lot of this is not going to come upon you as a, as, a, as a shock because it's, you know, there are still lag time between when they start clearing land and when students will actually start showing up at your schools. Um, so that would be the scenario that you guys approved already. Uh, and then this third slide is what, was, what would happen if we closed Pine Forge and we, there was a couple small changes. Um, I think some of Earl was going to Colebrookdale and some of Pine Forge was going to Boyertown. And you see that the, there's still a nice distribution of the utilization of the buildings, but you're still gonna have that one issue in New Hanover because it still takes into effect the, the scenario one changes. So that would still be something we want to, you know, make sure that we keep our eye on. Um, but there is the possibility of um, space being available in other buildings to accommodate the loss of one of your, of one of your schools. And I believe the last slide um, shows the two, um, scenario one and scenario two next to each other where you can see what's been approved, which is the scenario one, still shows some schools under-enrolled, um, primarily Pine Forge and Earl, um, whereas in scenario two, you'll see a, bit, a little bit more of a, uh, uh, the schools within the ex you know, ideal utilization range. Um, obviously, without the New Hanover is a little high. Um, Washington, but Washington was surprisingly going up, so I, I don't, I, I expect that to be at 83% may very well be a little bit higher in five years. Um, and then Boyertown West is uh, a little bit lower than we expect it uh, at this time. But again, um, as the developments change, we can, we can, we might be able to see some changes that in the future. This is our, this is obviously the best guess based on, uh, in just, you know, the trending models. The board members, as you look at the legend, uh, the color coding legend is on the bottom right. Uh, anything in green is uh, 85 to 100 percent, and I misspoke earlier. I said 90 to 100 is 85 to 100 percent. As you can see, um, scenario uh, two in this case uh, shows an increase in green. Um, uh, even the two yellows um, are at 83, just below the 85 percent or better threshold. Uh, the one concern uh, they highlighted in New Hanover is because of the, uh, we think that the Marinara track is actually moving a year ahead of schedule. And as we've said from the beginning of this process that one of the challenges that districts face is that they don't monitor this on a regular scheduled process, um, that it could be a problem. And in this case, what you saw is you have the increase of movement in New Hanover, but also there's a side effect of the increase that will impact uh, Middle School East also in the projections. Thus, it looks a little bit higher than originally projected. So we clearly, in order to provide some relief to East, will need to be revisiting this uh, in the near future, else uh, they will uh, continue to grow and create a challenge for them. And what you will see is what we consider an inequitable equ distribution and use between our two middle schools. When you have 
a five uh, percentage point difference, which is actually better than the previous eight percentage point difference. So we actually have closed the gap and met many of the projected goals by going through this process. Uh, it is also important uh, to remember <clears throat> that we have laid out for you that I believe it's more fiscally prudent uh, to, at this point, not, not think about um, building or adding because we cannot afford it. The board took that off the table and Ms. Nyman pointed it out in a past agenda item, so that is not something that's on the table. It is not something that this administration at this time could recommend. Um, and given the numbers, I'd rather see a more solid development of uh, the development showing up because of some of the wavering in the economy that we've heard back and forth. Uh, additionally, um, the, the first line of defense means that if we're going to be conservative, because once you build or, or go into the building process, you're locking taxpayers into a bill. And if they don't show up, we still have that bill. What that means, though, is that if we continue to be, and I believe we should be conservative given our fiscal challenges, if this does take off, we will have to play catch up. But what that means is that we would obviously do more redistricting to balance out the use of our buildings as the first line of defense. Uh, if that becomes a problem, then the next line of defense would be we'd have to consider portables and trigger the plan con process while you're in portables with understanding that the only recommendation that I would see plausible if we continue to manage our finances would be the old plan that you had in place that just sunset it would be to add an addition on to Culbertdale and make that building which could then at that time would hold another 300, 350 more students. Uh, you need to know that that was projected $2 million price tag per year as a bill. Thus the challenge of why we could not do that anytime soon. Um, at this point in time that is uh, the update. We do have a plan should the enrollment grow but as you can see we also still have space to move people around in the current uh, projections okay uh, so with that uh, again thought it was important uh, to provide this uh, short update to the board uh, as uh, Bill Montgomery stated uh, there were, weren't really many changes from what was presented before but uh, once again, I think with this important vote, uh, we wanted to uh, provide you this along with the financial update uh, based on the union negotiations and uh, potentially settling uh, the contract. So with that, uh, I don't know if there's any board member questions uh, quickly for uh, Montgomery Associates or Tim. Uh, okay, uh, Mr. Lewis. An easy question. With respect to the numbers, let's say, 10 years out, um, as presented, let's say, last April, did your recent fine-tuning of the current s situation in any substantial way ch uh, change that 10-year projection? Not necessarily. Uh, primarily due because the majority of the developments that we we're looking at would have ended by then. So it's just almost shifting the numbers in the years before between here and 10 years from now. Um, the reason the, the one looks a little odd is if, because we're one year closer to what we're looking at, and if a, if a development comes forward one year, that's actually a two-year difference between when we last presented and now. I guess my point was there's nothing hugely radical in the base assumptions other than the timing. There's not, there were suddenly 15 new developments proposed and so on and so on. That's what I meant. Thank you. Last, last, first time we were here, last December, uh, we had talked about the increase in developments. And one of the things we had said then is, we're not here, there's not a panic. You still have time. And as Dr. Ben said, it just needs to monitor these, these developments that are coming on and making sure that you have space. And he did mention you might have to do some more reorganization as you go along until eventually you get to the point where you say, you're going to need that two or three year lead time. We need to start thinking about whatever your plan is to house additional students. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for that update. Certainly, this is a, a prudent thing. Appreciate your time, gentlemen. Uh, 
and prudent moving forward uh, to, to continue to keep a pulse on this. All right, next up we have uh, public comment period number one. Uh, before we get started, we have five people that signed up. I just have a quick statement. On behalf of the Board of School Directors, I would like to welcome you to our meeting. This is our business meeting. Uh, we welcome your attendance and input from stakeholders to assist us with making recommendations and decisions related to the Boyertown Area School District. The procedures and rules for public participation are detailed in BASD Board Policy 006. This document is available uh, on the BASD website. Participants properly registered on the sign-up sheet will be recognized by the presiding officer. Public comment period number one is limited to topics on tonight's agenda only. Participants must preface their comments by an announcement of their name, address, and group affiliation in the event that is appropriate. All statements, inquiries, or comments shall be directed to the presiding officer. No participant may address or question board members individually, administrative team members individually, school employees, or members of the public individually. Note that we value and will not compromise the privacy of our students and staff. Please see us outside the realm of a public meeting in the event you have a question about an individual staff member or student. If your public comment does include a question, Dr. Bedden or a member of the staff will be in contact with you to confirm your question and provide you with information. It will not be answered uh, in our public meeting tonight. Comments are limited to three minutes and comment periods are limited to 30 minutes. Individu individuals may indicate a desire to speak a second time if there is time left on the 30, in the 30 minute period. Finally, please note that we do record our board meetings uh, and committee meetings, and we post them on YouTube with a link to our website. We do request that if you do wish to take pictures or record the meeting yourself, that you do so in a non-disruptive and discreet manner and use those materials respectfully and responsibly. So with that, first up I have uh, signed up as John Landino. Uh, the topic is Pine Forge. Good evening. The closure of a school is a sensitive topic. While I support neighborhood schools, you need enough of a population to sustain one. What is happening is not a surprise. We have seen the demographic trends for years. Couples are having children later in life and less children per household. Unfortunately, population gains on the eastern side of the district have not been enough to offset the student loss on the western side. Here is a very simple fact. Last school year, we had four out of five grade schools on the western side of the district with less than 70% utilization. That means they are more than 30% empty. Think about that. Four out of five Berks grade schools were 30% or more empty. That is a shocking number. The reality is nothing has changed since I was on the board three years ago. You can't ignore the demographic challenges we are facing, and you can't be afraid as a board to vote on difficult topics. Three years ago, I asked the board a simple question. If more than 30% empty is not enough to make a decision, then what is? 40% empty, 50% empty, what is the number? I'd still like an answer to that question, and I think you owe the public an answer to that question if you plan to spend millions to keep Pine Forge open. Lastly, I get the emotions behind this vote. I attended a high school that was closed. What, what you need to keep in mind is closing Pine Forge doesn't take away the school's history or pride of attending. Use the rest of the year to celebrate the history of the school and all the students who attended over the years. There's a lot to celebrate. Good luck. Okay, next up we have uh, Veronica, Veronica Reiner, and the topic is Pine Forge. 
Okay, I got uh, the wave. Uh, okay. Next up is Ellen Marginetti, if I said that correctly. Subject is also Pine Forge. Good evening. Uh, it's Martinetti. Did a pretty good job. Um, I am a parent of students that have gone through Pine Forge. Um, I am also a paraprofessional at Pine Forge. I'm a community member, so I'm well invested in this town. Um, there's just one thing that's just been bothering me through all of the presentations and conversations, and it's the cost that keeps going up on the screen of what it's going to cost to renovate Pine Forge. It's anywhere from one million to eight million, and that is one huge gap. And I want to know if you were to renovate your house and you came in with estimates with that big of a gap, I would hope you would ask a lot of questions. And why is there a big difference in cost? And what are those costs? That that has not been really outlined for the public. Um, that's that's a huge deficit in my opinion. Um, and then tonight you're talking about all the growth on the Montgomery County side. And I know a lot of concerns are if you close Pine Forge and then the growth continues and we have to shift kids and now we have overcrowded schools, they're full to capacity and are we gonna have to build a whole new school? And that's gonna be much more costly than you know, closing the school. And there's costs incurred in closing a school. You have to move staff move their belongings. You have to still maintain the facility while it's on the real estate market. Um, so there are a lot of other conversations I think that still need to be had before this decision is made. Um, another issue, working in the school, and I, I know it's not just Pine Forge, our students are stressed at an elementary school level. And it's really sad because they should not be stressed. They should be having fun and love school and love learning. And if you're focusing on a social emotional learning platform, closing Pine Forge is not gonna help that. We will have more students in a classroom and those kids will be even twice as stressed as they already are now. And it's nothing against the staff because Pine Forge has an amazing staff that love their kids and do all they can, as all of our teachers do across the board. I'm sure of that in every school. But I want you to consider the kids. It's a changing world, and they have so much more pressure than they ever had. 30 seconds. In the past. So please keep them in mind. Thank you. Okay, next up we have uh, Nathan uh, Yorgi. Yorgi, and uh, the, t the subject is also Pine Forge. So good evening, pull this off. So you've had to listen to me talk at every board meeting that's related here up until this, so some of you may be thankful that this is the last you'll hear of me before you take your vote, but I'll be back because here's the thing. You have a forecasted deficit over six years that our chief financial officer put together, which shows that even with closing Pine Forge, we're running a $20 million deficit by 2025. That's a fact that's been put out on the, on the district website. I don't think it can be refuted. Yet we sit up here and we say, oh, we're gonna start, act, we're gonna start taxing by the X1 index. Let's look historically at what we've taxed at. Has it been the X1 index? No. Has it been anywhere close to that? No. So why do we think we're gonna put our head in the sand like an ostrich and go, we'll start taxing by the X1 index now once we close Pine Forge? You've got a spending issue. You've got a deficit issue. Why don't we fix that before we start thinking about closing schools and right-sizing? Because guess what? If we close Pine Forge, you're sending the Pine Forge students to schools that, in your own words, are just as derelict from a facility standpoint as the school you've just closed. Does it make any sense? No. Does it make you have the ability to sleep better at night knowing, well, we've got back $1.8 million a year? which we'll probably squander because we're in a deficit and we haven't figured out how to spend our money wisely. So why would we do this now? Let's pause, let's not vote to close, and yes, I have vested interest, Pine Forge rocks, we, we get it, but I'm also here because I also work for a large company and I get numbers. 
and the numbers you're putting out there and the future numbers you're putting out there don't add up. They don't solve a problem for us. If anything, closing Pine Forge puts us further down the road with issues. So let's not make a vote tonight to close Pine Forge. Let's allow the new board to come on with some of you that will still be here and let's start figuring out ways to solve our deficit, which one, by taxing at the X1 index, and frankly, you're gonna to need to tax above that for at least three to five years. I'd like you to ask the chief financial officer to run numbers that if we ask for an exemption, how many years would we need to tax above Act 1 to be able to get us where we need to be? Then let's set up some community groups filled with people who run businesses 30 in seconds. and figure out some creative ways to, to cut our expenses. Many of those are going to be painful for all of us, but we need to find ways to do that. And those are the things we should be doing before we hastily decide to close a school, which may or may not help us, but we honestly know isn't going to help us with the deficit at all. So good luck, make the best choices that you can, but remember, this choice tonight to close doesn't end the deficit. Okay, next up is Krista Gross, and the subject is uh, Pine Forge Elementary School. I sent this to all of you board members earlier, and I just want the public to hear. The idea of being one Boyertown is a great concept and, and an amazing ideal to work towards. But the reality is, Berks and Montgomery County are very different, different in ways that make decisions like closing a school a very crucial one. The harsh truth is that the elementary schools in Montgomery County have the lowest percentage of free and reduced lunches. Gilbertsville Elementary has 17%, New Hanover has 11%, while the percentages in Berks County are significantly higher. Pine Forge has 37%, Colebrookdale 44, Boyertown 34, Earl 31, and Washington 28. These statistics are staggering, especially if you break, if you break the percentages down into the actual number of kids per school, with New Hanover and Gilbertsville having the most kids and the lowest percentage. Here is where my heart begins to race as I go into work every week and deal with continuous safety care calls day after day. Our kids need help, and their parents don't have, always have the resources to help them. So every day we go in and give these kids all the help we can possibly provide while they are in our care. Many of us donate our own time and resources to help these families in any way we can, but often it just isn't enough. Many of these kids need social and emotional help, needs that go past the boundaries of the classroom help that often their parents can't afford or don't have access to. I just don't see how you can close a school and put all the kids in other schools that are struggling just as bad. Maybe they can handle it over Montgomery County, but I can assure you that we cannot. We cannot handle more kids in our classrooms. Our teachers are already stressed, as well as our students. If you care even a little bit about the social and emotional needs of our students, you will not vote to close Pine Forge. Our suicide rates will go up. Our special needs costs will go up. The safety of our students will rapidly decline, and it will be an awful decision for a growing district. The kids are counting on you. They're counting on you. Okay, next up we have approval of uh, the minutes. Uh, this is from our October 22nd, 2019 meeting. Mr. Brees, motion. Mrs. Usavage, second. Uh, questions or comments on our minutes from that meeting? Okay, seeing none, roll call vote, please. Sorry. Mr. Foose? Yes. Mr. Foose? Yes. Ms. Nyman? Yes. Mr. Brees? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Mrs. Usavage? Yes. Mrs. Denon? Yes. Mr. Boyer? Yes. Ms. Deeroff? Yes. Mr. Elsier? Yes. 9-0. Okay, next up is a uh, report of the president. Uh, I have none. Next up is the secretary's report. No report. Solicitor's report. No report. Okay, we're moved to our student representative's report. Okay, 
Good evening. Congratulations to girls soccer for winning states in a 1-0 victory over Conestoga in the PIAA Class 4A Girls Soccer Championship match at Hershey Park Stadium. Congratulations to the boys soccer for making it to the state semifinals. Congratulations to the ba Bash Marching Band for placing fourth at Nationals. The battle of the classes has begun. Teachers at Bash have been recording school participation in student council-led dress-down days and other school fundraisers. Based on the recorded information, points have been awarded to the students' participation and totaled for each class. Currently, seniors are winning and juniors are holding off the sophomores by a slim margin for second place. Tickets are now on sale to see Bash performing the musical Mamma Mia on April 2nd, 3rd, and 4th at 7 p.m. or on April 5th at 2 p.m. All tickets are being sold online at www.voyertownmusic.com. You will be able to choose your own seats and see what seats are available. On December 13th, East will be holding their band holiday concert from 7 to 9 p.m. On December 16th, West will be holding their band holiday concert from 7 to 8 p.m. The winter concert for bash bands will be held on December 10th at 7 p.m. Come out and show support for the bash orchestra and choir in their annual winter concert being held on December 18th in the new auditorium. The concert starts at 7. Congratulations to the senior girls for winning the Powder Puff game. The total amount raised by the fundraiser for cancer was over $4,000. Thank you and have a great evening. Okay, thank you as always for that update. Uh, we appreciate hearing from our student reps. Uh, some great news uh, going on in the district. Thank you so much. Okay, next we'll move to the uh, superintendent's report uh, with the uh, consent agenda, I believe. Yes. Uh, Mr. President, the other item you received earlier and then the information for professional learning is available online. Um, <clears throat> superintendent's report consent agenda. Uh, we would like to present to the board items A through uh, H for approval, the approval of Mr. Lamar Hayes as board treasurer, uh, the program of studies, the donation of playground equipment, coral risers and wireless access points, uh, the conditional preliminary final acceptance uh, notice for the president's signature with our partnership with the township, the ratification of the purchase of district phone system that has already uh, begun implementation, uh, the BASD delegate and alternate delegate to the Berks County Tax Collection Committee and Executive Committee. Uh, overnight trips, is the board's practice to approve any of the overnight trips? A clarification, there was one that was a little confusing to people. It is at BASH, so that is a correct um, listing that when people ask with their overnight, why are they not leaving? It is at the school. Uh, and then a settlement agreement for student 240048. Uh, the administration recommends approval of the consent agenda. Okay, looking for a motion, Mr. Lewis. The second, Ms. Nyman. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Foos? Yes. Ms. Nyman? Yes. Mr. Brees? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Mrs. Usavage? Yes. Mrs. Denon? Yes. Mr. Boyer? Yes. Ms. Deeroff? Mr. Elsier? Yes. 9-0. Moving on to uh, the itemized agenda. Uh, item A is administration is recommended to Board of School Directors approves uh, the proposed new four-year collective bargaining agreement with the BAEA. Uh, so we present to the board for approval. Okay, need a motion. Ms. Deeroff, uh, second. Uh, Mr. Brees, questions or comments on the agreement? Uh, we kind of went over that extensively at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, Ms. Nyman. Well, I want the contract to go through. Um, I'm a little bit upset at the fact that we have to close Pine Forge. I'm going to say yes to the contract, but with the idea that I am not going for the Pine Forge closure. That is unacceptable to me because our students will not benefit by that. Okay. Any other questions or comments concerning the BAEA contract? Call for the vote. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Foos? Yes. Ms. Nyman? Yes. Mr. Brees? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Mrs. Usavage? Yes. Mrs. Denon? Yes. 
Mr. Boyer? Yes. Ms. Deroff? Yes. Mr. Elsier? Yes. 9-0. Item number B, <clears throat> the Pine Forge Elementary School closure. Uh, the administration has recommended that the Board of School Directors approve scenario two, resulting in the closure of Pine, For Pine Forge Elementary School according to section 13-1311A of the Public School Code of 1949 and according to section 13-1311A of the Public School Code. Okay, looking for a motion and a second. Mrs. Usavage, looking for a second. Uh, Mrs. Denon, questions or comments on the potential closure of Pine Forge Elementary School? Okay, Mrs. Denon, I see Mrs. You Savage in the queue. Um, yes, thank you. I want to thank the administration and my fellow board members and the community for their thoughtful debate, analysis, feedback, and the engagement regarding Pine Forge. For the past five years, I have carefully listened to stakeholders and taken into consideration all sides of this issue. It has been a very difficult and emotional decision. Before I explain my vote, I want to give a little background as to how we got here. The fact is, we do not have the financial resources to keep this school open at this time. This is due in part to six plus years of votes by some board members to unwillingly adequately fund our schools. and at the same time, not offering any alternatives or solutions to solving our fiscal crisis. At the end of the day, our responsibility as board members is to provide a thorough and efficient education for all students. I can understand and emphasize with the legitimate concerns of parents in the Pine Forge community. However, I truly believe that closing Pine Forge and using the additional resources gained by the closure will in the end benefit all students and our stakeholders in the community. If I did not believe that this is a step towards improving academic outcomes while being fiscally responsible, I would not be voting to close Pine Forge. Thank you. Okay, next up, uh, Mrs. Usavage. Thank you. So as I was thinking about the end of my 10 years on the board and um, this, this particular decision reminded me of one of the first decisions I had to make when I came on the board in Janu around January of 2010 um, and that was to go self-insured. And what was so difficult about that is one of the same things that makes this so difficult and that is that we are making a decision based on projections of the future. None of us have a crystal ball, and so we really have to think about how we gather that information and how much we can trust that information and make a decision based on that. Um, so I really did want to um, give the community the benefit of understanding my vote today and how I thought about this. Um, the considerations included our financial status, both short-term and long-term. Um, equity, that means um, providing an equitable education to our students regardless of their school. Um, efficient long-term facility utilization and community sentiment. In terms of cost savings, we have this opportunity to have significant savings in personnel costs and maintenance that give us the opportunity to reduce our operating costs and meet the needs of our students and to help us stop operating by dipping into our savings every year. We'll also have a cost avoidance that we would be required to upgrade Pine Forge Elementary School if we were to keep it open. And yes, there is a big range of cost that that will cost depending on what we do. The lower numbers are if we just add air conditioning and the very minimum, and the larger numbers are if we bring things up to code. And I'm not sure if those comments are exactly accurate, but generally that's how I think about it. Um, space utilization, this is the hardest part. Again, thinking about these predictions 
We have hired experts that do this for a living. We know that um, predictions are probably not good much further than five years, so we've looked at that. Um, and my opinion on this is that we have space for at least five years and probably beyond. Um, and then as far as our finances long term, we are out of fund balance in just a few years. And if we run out of that, this is the bottom line. If we run out of that, it hurts every student in our school, including our Pine Forge students and our future students. Excuse me, uh, Mrs. Hugh Savage, I uh, just want to, uh, with our new policy of three minutes, you're down to about 30 seconds, please. Oh boy, okay, okay. Um, Thank you. So um, I, I did want to uh, cut that short and just talk about how I thought about the public concerns. I know that some people don't have confidence in the numbers. Um, the larger class sizes, I feel there that um, based on my experience at Boyertown, um, we will deliver the, the, the high quality education that is expected to every child, no matter what school they're in. And the longer bus rides, administration has assured us that they will keep those ride times to a reasonable limit and we'll hold them to that. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we now have uh, Ms. Nyman and I have Mr. Brees in the queue. Thank you. I want to go on record that I am not in favor of closing Pine Forge Elementary School. Some of my reasons are as follows. Too much unknown as to the building that is going on in the district. To close Pine Forge at this time is not beneficial to our students. Should this board close Pine Forge in a year or two, and we have an overload of students coming in board, because there's no guarantee to what's coming. I hear different things of, of other buildings going on that aren't on their books, and if they go on the books, they're going to be done just like that. What's that going to do to the population? How are we going to accommodate those students? That being said, what would that do to the budget? If we would be required to add on to Coberdale and increase our, our finances, would we have to do a referendum in order to build an addition or a new school? Are we not here for the best education for all students? Are we not here for the safety of all students? We close Pine Forge and we put those kids into other schools. What's that going to do to the safety and health and to the education? We have one bad year of education. How many years is it going to take to get our students back out of that? It could take two years, three years. There's no guarantee. Personally, I have three grandchildren in the schools. I don't want to see that happen. Finally, with five new board members coming on this board the beginning of December, think before you vote on this and straddle them with your decision. Let's table this vote and leave the incoming board who will have to live with this vote make the decision because I cannot jeopardize not even one student's health and safety and education to close a school. Hey, thank you. I now have uh, Mr. Brees and uh, uh, Mr. Foos in the queue and Mrs. Deeroff. Uh, did she make a motion to table the vote? Did you want to make a motion? Because I'll second it. All right, then I'll second the motion. <clears throat> have a vote. Have a vote on tabling the vote. Okay. We're going to have the vote on table and the vote? What are we doing? That's what we do. Okay. So we now go to the solicitor. Yeah, there's no, uh, there's no discussion on a motion to table. Mm -hmm. So a vote of yes will table the motion. A vote of no will not. I would suggest that we go directly to a roll call. Okay. Mr. So, go ahead. I'm sorry. Roll call. Mr. Foos? No. Ms. Nyman? Yes. Mr. Brees? Yes. Mr. Lewis? No. Mrs. Usavage? No. Mrs. Denon? No. Mr. Boyer? No. Mrs. Deeroff? Yes. Mr. Elsier? 
No. Motion fails, 6-3. Okay, next up in the queue, I have, oh, you, you still had, okay. All right, Mr. Brees, and then I have Mr. Foose and Mrs. Deeroff in the queue. Thank you. Um, I want to point out a couple of things. Uh, first off, closing a school is a permanent solution. And we shouldn't be closing a school for, for budgetary reasons. I'm, I'm opposed to that. We shouldn't be doing anything that's going to not help academic standards and academic outcome in our schools. And I don't think closing a school helps academically at all. It is for a budgetary issue. I think it's really rich that some who are voting to close the school due to needing to close a budget shortfall are the same people who never met a spending proposal they didn't like. This is truly a neighborhood school. Douglas Township is no longer going to have a neighborhood school. That's just my issue with that. Uh, and what's interesting about that is oftentimes when school districts or counties around the state close schools, it's because there's another neighborhood school nearby, you know, within a few miles. Years ago when we closed the Lincoln School over here in Boyertown, I mean, we had the Boyertown L not far away. And, and, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that we had these schools. But when you close smaller schools, it has to do with the fact that you're going to relocate kids to nearby schools, other neighborhood schools. That's not the case here. That's not the case here. People in a community, in a county, or I should say a township, are going to lose their neighborhood school and their children will be bussed off to other neighborhoods, other townships. And of course, you know, they'll still get the academic uh, support that they need. But I think my main concern on all this is that Pine Forge is a performing school. It's one of the top 500 elementary schools in the state. And I think I'm amazed that we're closing a school that's performing like that to close a budgetary shortfall. I'm, I'm opposed to it. The building has been maintained throughout the years. I was talking to a fellow at the polls recently when I was working the polls over in Washington. And uh, he was talking to me about the fact, he says, oh, it's a crumbling school. I says, well, that's an insult to the people that have their kids going there. It's an insult to the school district to think that we're going to be allowing buildings to be crumbling down. The fact is, these schools have been maintained. And the records are there. We don't repair roofs. We put brand new roofs on these buildings. Uh, there's a lot of things that we do that, to maintain these buildings. And these buildings have been repaired and they have been maintained. So again, I'm opposed to closing the school. I think that we, uh, we need to approach it from a different end. I certainly think it's a political end around the brand new board that's coming in. This board shouldn't be voting on it. I don't believe this board should be voting on closing the school. Uh, the new board directors that were voted in were voted in to save the school. And we're going to put them in a bad spot. Excuse me, Mr. Brees, 30 seconds, please. Okay, thank you. So in my, uh, my opinion, I think that uh, it's not, uh, I think it's a political maneuver to uh, allow this board to play this. And uh, I think the new board should be the one to vote it in or vote it off. And uh, it should be the result, it should be the responsibility of the new board to vote for the, for the school, not this one here. Thank you. Okay, next up I have Mr. Foose, followed by Mrs. Uh, uh, Deeroff in the queue. I prepared a couple of pages of comments, so obviously I'll have to uh, trim some of that down. Um, Luckily, some of my colleagues have touched on a few of the items that uh, I also wanted to address. Uh, first and foremost, though, was that this has not been a uh, expedited or hasty process. Uh, as far as I, as far as I know, discussions around um, utilization of our buildings and whether or not uh, whether or not taking one offline would be more efficient actually began as far back as 2012, and in 2017. I spoke out publicly and criticized the board at that time for not uh, actually going forward with redistricting. Uh, they, they, at that time, decided that the uh, move to the ninth grade at the high school and the middle school model was enough change, and they wanted to um, push redistricting of the elementary schools off to the next board. And so here we are. So I find it a little bit nonsensical that we're saying we should push it off further to another board because we were, in fact, elected to get things done and we're still seated. We've been studying this for almost the entire two years that I've been on this board, and it's been a, a, a very long process with a lot of data, a lot of consideration. 
numerous meetings and a lot of discussion, thoughtful discussion. Uh, so I, I think the time is here that we need to make a decision. Um, I think seven years time is probably ample time. Uh, I also wanted to clarify that when we hired uh, Dr. Bedden, this was one of the things that we asked him right away was we recognize a need to redistrict and we asked him to give us some proposals. Um, he did that and despite being asked repeatedly from uh, various board members to recommend the various proposals that were put before us, he declined to do that. He said that uh, all of these have merit and that it was up to the board to make that decision. Dr. Bedden was absolutely not hired, as has been stated in the public. Uh, he was not hired to close a school. And the fact that that falsehood has been permeated through our community is troubling to me. I think he's done a wonderful job in the time that he's been here. He expressed that he wanted to reduce the amount we pull out of our Peasers Fund uh, to below a million dollars in the budget, and he was able to accomplish that. He also uh, renegotiated our, the leases on our copying machines, renegotiated with the BCIU for our uh, Excuse collaboration. Excuse me, Mr. Foose, uh, 30 seconds, please. And among other things, that has resulted in a favorable bond rating and uh, reassessed credit rating from those agencies. Lastly, I wanted to, to point out that, um, unfortunately, this really does come down to a matter of how we spend our dollars and how we allocate them and how that benefits students. I do believe the ability to hire more counselors would be a benefit to all the students in the district. The ability to possibly get our librarians back to full time at our middle schools would certainly benefit students who will move up to both of those schools. I would like to see us expand foreign languages to lower grades and find other ways that we can be flexible with how we deliver languages of need. And I think these are all things that the, the next board should be prioritizing in a meaningful way through transparent discussions. But we need the flexibility to be able to do that. And the projections show that we have space and we're out of money. Is that closure, Mr. Foose? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Next up is uh, Mrs. Uh, Deeroff. OK, we can spin this closing this school or keeping it open any way we want. Uh, if we need. Sorry. Uh, we need, one of the biggest things we need to do is watch over our spending. As one of the previous uh, people, when they spoke, for a constituent from Pine Forge, arguing 100%. We hire consultants. We can get a consultant to say, Anything we want them to say, they'll spin it the way we want it. As far as Pine Forge, every time they needed repairs over there, they got leftovers. They got what was left. A uh, typical example was the clocks when they had needed clocks over there. They didn't get the state of the art like other schools. They got clocks that they have a lot of problems with. And that's just one example. As far as Pine Forge needing repairs, why? Why do they need more repairs than any other school? Because we always let them go. We let them sit. We didn't go ahead and, and do what we did with the other schools. And, and that was wrong. Everybody else got air conditioning. Pine Forge got nothing. Uh, that's why when you look at the figures, they need to spend a lot of money over there. We will find the money if we keep Pine Forge open to make the repairs that need to be made and bring it up to what the other schools are like. This is ridiculous that you have one school that gets absolutely nothing and you never hear them complain. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Lewis. Okay, I'll keep, I'll keep this short because a lot of the comments have already been made, but yes, to, to a great extent, this is about budgetary issues and it is about money, um, we do need to re substantially reduce our costs. And let's face it, low school capacity utilization is a costly proposition. Um, over the years, I've heard people say, oh, school districts should be run more like businesses. And if that were the case, at least, one of our at least one of our elementary schools would have already been closed down, probably. Um, the analysis shows 
basically, and, and, and to somebody else's point made earlier, we have uh, three schools now that are less than 65% utilized. Um, the analysis does show that this closure allows us to both direct key re redirect key resources and still avoid about a million dollars per year in expenses. Critics expressed concern, particularly, and this is what I want to cover, uh, about the future enrollment, so we'll run out of space and all this stuff. Um, we just heard from our experts at Montgomery Educational Consultants and Absolute Technology. Uh, I'm going back to the April presentation where the projections that went out 10 years, and sure enough, our elementary school enrollment by those projections would grow by nearly 370 students. Uh, but Scenario 2 provides enough seats for that. With 45% to spare, that's over 170 excess seats. Um, and again, how good is a 10-year projection? But I do not see the risk uh, in, in future expanding enrollments uh, that have been repeatedly said. Um, also, let's consider the alternatives we have for balancing budgets. Uh, cost reductions of this kind of magnitude would certainly involve something that is equally disturbing to the, the outcomes of students, and that is fewer course offerings, fewer music and arts programs, fewer sports programs, and so on. And these cuts would just clearly have a negative impact on all of our students throughout the entire district, including the students currently attending Pine Forge Elementary. Um, anyway, for, I guess I'm probably out of time. I support the administration's uh, uh, plan to close Pine Forge Elementary School. Thank you. Okay, I just have a few uh, final thoughts on, uh, on this topic. Uh, I want to start off with, uh, to the people and uh, families in Pine Forge, it truly has been unfortunate that this action to close or not to close has gone on for almost three years now. Uh, as I'm sure many people are well aware, uh, this piece was looked at back in uh, 2017. And it's unfortunate that it's gone on this long uh, due to the turnover in the central administration, primarily, uh, where a major decision like that got put on the back burner. Uh, which, quite frankly, is why, uh, and I remember that meeting, that the board decided not to put air conditioning in Pine Forge uh, because there was a potential decision to be made. And that would have been, talk about uh, fiscal res ill responsibility uh, when the decision had been made. And I will tell you, uh, as a community member, a volunteer, as a school board member, this has been a difficult decision, but I truly believe has been made with the due diligence and much thought and input. And I want to thank the people that have provided input and feedback and acknowledge uh, th their input. As a board member, not returning to the board for another term, I, I cannot burden this decision on another board, not to mention a primarily new board uh, that would take months to get up to speed. Can't kick this one down, can't kick the can. I think that would be irresponsible as well. This is a veteran board, many years, and we've been looking at this for three years. It's time to make a decision one way or another. This does address the fiscal needs uh, of the district. It reduces headcount without reducing programs. Uh, as most, if not all, employees are planned to uh, fill vacancies in the district, it provides a new board with a clear path to fiscal sustainability. It also puts the district, uh, as I believe Mr. Foos mentioned, in a better, better position to address uh, the needs of adding counselors to our schools. And it also addresses the needed capital improvements to our buildings by having one less building, obviously. But it does provide a solid foundation for all students. 30 seconds, Mr. President. Thank you. So with that, uh, roll call vote, please. Mr. Foos? Yes. Ms. Nyman? No. Mr. Brees? No. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Mrs. Usavage? Yes. Mrs. Denon? Yes. Mr. Boyer? Yes. 
Ms. Deeroff? No. Mr. Elsier? Yes. Motion passes 6 3. Uh, Mr. President, uh, uh, Mrs. Artorsha will be taking over. Board members, I have to leave because of a problem with my daughter, but I did not want to leave before these two major items uh, were taken care of. So, Mr. Torsha, I have to fill in. Thank you. All right, so our assistant superintendent, uh, Mary Beth Torsha, will guide us through the remainder of the superintendent's report due to a situation, a personal situation for Dr. Bedden. Uh, so we are on uh, subject C. Transfer to the Capital Reserve Fund from the 2018-2019 budget. Uh, the recommended action is that the School Board of Directors approves the transfer of $250,000 to the Capital Reserve Fund from the 2018-19 budget. Okay, looking for a motion and a second. Okay, Mr. Brees, second, Mrs. Denon. Uh, before we take questions or comments, uh, I just want to uh, remind the board we did discuss this at length at our finance committee uh, and facilities meeting just recently. Uh, and basically it's just keeping the op option option open to tax, or, or no, I'm sorry, uh, this is the transfer of uh, the uh, excess funds and how, how we want to handle that. Questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, roll call vote, please. Mr. Foos? Yes. Ms. Nyman? Yes. Mr. Brees? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Mrs. Usavage? Yes. Mrs. Denon? Yes. Mr. Boyer? Yes. Ms. Ms. Deeroff? Yes. Mr. Elsier? Yes. Motion passes 9-0. <clears throat> Preliminary budget resolution, the recommended, recommended action is that the Board of School Directors adopts the following resolutions. One, resolution to publicize the district's intent to obtain the Pennsylvania Department of Education's approval of exceptions for the 2020-2021 budget. And two, resolution to acknowledge the re release of the 2020-2021 preliminary budget and approval to advertise intent to adopt the 2020-2021 preliminary budget at least 10 days prior to adoption. Okay, looking for a motion and a second. Uh, Mr. Breeze, second, Mrs. Usavage. Uh, this is the one I was just starting to reference. Uh, this just allows us to uh, keep the option uh, on the table to tax Act, Act 1 plus exceptions. Uh, it's just leaving the option there, nothing more. Questions or comments on this piece? Okay, roll call vote, please. Mr. Foos? Yes. Ms. Nyman? No. Mr. Brees? No. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Mrs. Usavage? Yes. Mrs. Denon? Yes. Mr. Boyer? Yes. Ms. Deeroff? No, I'm not going to lock in a new board. Uh, Mr. Elsier? Yes. Motion passes 6 3. Next is to approve change order GC034, rescind change order GC038, dated February 19th, 2019, and change order GC039, dated May 8th, 2019, and approve change order GC038, dated November 6, 2019, to E.R. Stubner, Inc. for Boyertown Area Senior High School additions and renovations. The recommended action is that the Board of School Directors approves change order GC-034, rescinds change order GC-038 dated February 19th, 2019, and change order GC-039 dated May 8th, 2019, and approves change order GC-038 dated November 6, 2019 for the Boyertown Area High School Additions and Renovations Project for ER Stubner Inc. Okay, looking for a motion and a second. Mrs. Denon, second. Uh, Mr. Foose, uh, questions or comments on this piece? Uh, this, in essence, would uh, close out the, uh, the high school project. No? Okay. A roll call vote, please. Mr. Foose? Yes. Ms. Nyman? Yes. Mr. Brees? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Mrs. Usavage? Yes. Mrs. Denon? Yes. Mr. Boyer? Yes. Ms. Deeroff? Yes. Mr. Elsier? Yes. 
Motion passes 9-0. Next, we have Add Freshman Academy TSA Technology Student Association Accounts to the Student Activity Fund. The recommended action is that the Board of School Directors approves the establishment of new accounts in the Student Activity Fund for the Freshman Academy TSA Technical Technology Student Association. Okay, looking for a motion and a second. Mr. Savage, second. Mr. Brees, questions or comments uh, on this piece for the TSA account? Okay, seeing none, roll call vote, please. Mr. Foose? Yes. Ms. Nyman? Yes. Pardon me? Okay, thank you. Mr. Brees? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Mrs. Usavage? Yes. Mrs. Denon? Yes. Mr. Boyer? Yes. Ms. Duroff? Yes. Mr. Elsier? Yes. Motion, motion passes 9-0. Next is personnel, and the action is that the Board of School Directors approves the items as noted. We have one professional, one classified, one, I'm sorry, that's retirement. First one is retirements for a professional and a classified. Under resignations, we have one professional, four classified. And under administration, that is to appoint um, a new administrator. We have one, five professional and four classified. And then we also have um, to approve the stage crew personnel for the 2019-2020 school year, and those are 10 students for stage crew. Uh, I believe we have substitutes as well. There's 14 of those and co-curricular activities, seven, Title I support specialist one, and change of employment status, we have four, classified one, for the change of status and then FMLA leaves of absence there are 10 professional leave requests we have let's see intermittent family medical leave of absence beginning with the November 4th and ending October 31st 2020 we have two classified and we have four uncompensated leave requests as well as the appointment of four mentor teachers Okay, looking for a motion and a second, Ms. Nyman, second, Mrs. Usavage. Uh, before we go to questions or comments, I just want to point out the administration person that uh, Ms. Torsha mentioned is the replacement, uh, the supervisor of transportation as a replacement for retiring uh, Steve Missimer. So that's just a replacement, not new position uh, at all. So questions or comments on personnel? Okay, seeing none, roll call vote, please. Mr. Foose? Yes. Ms. Nyman? Yes. <clears throat> Mr. Brees? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Mrs. Usavage? Yes. Mrs. Denon? Yes. Mr. Boyer? Yes. Ms. Deeroff? Yes. Mr. Elsier? Yes. Motion carries 9-0. Old business, Mr. President. Thank you. All right, any old business? Um, sensing that would be a no. Okay. Uh, next up, we have public comment period number two. Uh, we have one person signed up. I just want, want to remind them of the uh, statement I read earlier. And uh, you have uh, a three minute time frame. So signed up is Mr. John Landino, topic board transition. So I just want to take a quick opportunity to thank all the serving board members, whether you're staying on the board or leaving the board. Uh, we really appreciate the sacrifice that you've made uh, to do it as far as a community. Folks don't always understand or realize that you don't get paid for this. Many of you have families and full-time jobs on top of this, and this is another job on top of it. It is a huge time commitment. So. For the folks leaving us, especially uh, Mr. Savage, Mr. Elsier, who were instrumental in helping me when I was first considering running for the board, I really do appreciate your professionalism uh, and, and the way that you've dealt with folks and, and the community. So it's a, definitely a huge loss to have you guys leaving the board. So but I do want to thank all of you. Thank you again for your service to the district and welcome to the new board members that were 
voted in, and uh, thank you. Okay, next up, uh, we have board comments. Okay, I see Mr. Foos, Mrs. Dannon, and Mr. Brees in the queue. I had two topics I wanted to touch on. First is the uh, the student athletes that were recognized earlier. The um, all the fall all the fall sports, but particularly uh, the the soccer uh, teams that were here tonight. Um, they obviously achieved a great level of success. Um, but beyond that, uh, I I recall as a um, as a high school student or not a, a, as a youth um, in the youth wrestling program coming to watch uh, Zach Miller at the high school. And it was so neat as a, as a child to come watch um, a high school athlete performing in, in the sport that you participate in. And they look like giants and you look up to them. And um, my, my own children went to the uh, district soccer championships and we, we, watched, uh, we watched them perform there. And, um, and my, my youngest son was excited to get to see the giants on the soccer field. Um, so there are children that look up to them, there are community members that look up to them and are proud of them. Uh, but beyond what they've achieved on the soccer field and uh, cross country and golf and all the, all the folks that were recognized tonight, uh, they're really doing an outstanding job representing this community and, um, and I commend them for that. And then the other thing that I wanted to touch on this evening was, uh, as was just stated in public comment, uh, this is our last meeting with uh, several of the sitting board members and I greatly appreciate the time that, um, that I've had to serve with them. Uh, everybody who will be departing the board is, is, certainly, um, is certainly a loss and I appreciate all that you've, um, all that you've done for me is, as far as uh, friendship and knowledge and, um, and it's been quite an experience and I, I will absolutely miss the outgoing board members and look forward to the new board being seated and, and working together to uh, try and achieve uh, additional goals and move our district forward. Thank you. Okay, next up I have uh, Mrs. Dannon followed by Mr. Brees in the queue. Um, yes, I just want to echo what um, our community members and some of the board members have said. Um, I want to thank the departing board members, but I would like to um, also just especially thank Mr. Boyer for not only sitting on the board but doing um, an, an amazing amount of work with our students and constantly being at our, our schools and helping out with the Music League and uh, just being a, a very engaged board member um, within our school community. Uh, I wanted to thank Mr. Lewis for his analysis and his detailed data presentations on issues ranging from finances to facilities. Um, he's always willing to talk about tough decisions and always studies all the material uh, given to us. Mrs. Usavage, she's has served the board for almost 10 years and I want to personally thank her for her friendship, advice, and for being a leader in civility. She has challenged the board to be our best and has brought a sense of calmness and professionalism to our board. I will miss her unique perspective on the policies and the issues. And finally, I want to thank Mr. Elsier, who has served as our board president this year. It has been a very challenging year with the board having to make some very difficult decisions and I want to thank him for his leadership. Mr. Elsier is one of the most ethical, even keeled, and responsible people I know. He never takes decisions lightly and always does his homework. He has taken his time, his own paper, and his own ink to always print out the agendas and all of the school board materials so he can have the information right at his fingertips. And I always appreciated him being able to pull out a spreadsheet or a budget from his files which he would bring to every meeting. He is truly a dedicated public servant who rarely missed a meeting in his eight years on the board. You will all be missed and once again thank you for your service to the board. Okay, Mr. Brees. Thank you very much. <clears throat> yes, and uh, I want to thank the people that served. Uh, the, the prior board, I, I think it's uh, you know, with the prior board president, who made the comments. I, I appreciate his comments. He truly was a leader in this organization that stepped down after one term. <clears throat> but I think also, too, uh, Steve, you've done a good job uh, running the meetings. I appreciate it. Uh, you do run the board well. I should say the, the, the meetings well. Um, I appreciate the input that people put into this and the work they put into this. And I thank everybody 
everybody who's served on this board is leaving. Uh, all the people that are leaving this board, Donna, Steve, Rod, I thank you all for being here and serving uh, for this community because we don't get paid. We're a part of a volunteer effort. And with political differences aside, to not be able to thank people is unbelievable to me. I'm, I'm just blown away by that. But notwithstanding, talk a little bit about thankfulness. With the U.S. in the throes of a civil war, Lincoln issued a Thanksgiving Day proclamation to make the last Thursday in November a national holiday. Sarah Hale was an editor of a real popular women's magazine in the 1860s called Gotti's Ladies Book, whatever that was. She urged Lincoln to issue the proclamation for Thanksgiving, saying that this would establish a great union festival of America. She felt it would bring this country together in a time of our greatest division, which was the Civil War. Lincoln stated in his proclamation, no human council has devised nor has any mortal hand worked out the gracious gifts of the Most High God who, while dealing with us in anger for our sins, has never, nevertheless rem remembered mercy on us. Folks, we need to celebrate Thanksgiving in the spirit of unity in this country. Some teachers across America and some schools are striving to have their students unlearn, that's right, unlearn Thanksgiving. What Marxist activists say is nothing more than a feel-good Thanksgiving myth. They want their students to understand what the European colonial invaders did and their ensuing oppression of the people that were here. This is the insanity that's in this country right now that the school boards should be on guard against. Thanksgiving is truly an American tradition that must be preserved and protected. Thank you. Okay. Uh, lastly, I would just, oh, Mrs. You Savage. Uh, you know, sorry, I just saw your hand. All right. I, I did feel like uh, as the last board meeting for me, um, I just wanted to thank everyone who worked with me. Um, I want to thank and acknowledge the hard work of board members past, present, and those willing to serve in the future. It is a hard job for me. I know it was a real growth opportunity professionally. I now feel like I've seen just about everything. <laughs> um, and, so, and thank you to um, administration, um, again, past and present and hopefully future um, in leading this district forward. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. and. Um, finally, thank you to the voters for allowing me to represent the community and the students of our district. Okay, I, I, I'll just uh, wrap it up real quick here. Uh, I would personally, uh, in the spirit of Thanksgiving, uh, in no particular order, thank Mr. Boyer for, I believe it's been about a year and a half, came in to uh, fulfill a uh, vacancy, so thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Brees, uh, four years, uh, as I think you pointed out, uh, this is a voluntary job. So I guess it's technically not a job because we're not getting paid. I believe the definition of a job is you get paid. But thank you for your four years. Uh, uh, Mr. Lewis, uh, four years as well. Uh, thank you for that. I know it's been stressful here and there, uh, but uh, and, and last but not least, uh, Mrs. You Savage, uh, 10 years, God bless you. Uh, you know, I got the eight, but I, I do want to truly thank everyone uh, for their time and attention. There is a lot of uh, work behind the scenes uh, going through the information, the packet, uh, the meetings on Tuesday nights. Uh, and quite honestly, for me, it's, it's a little bittersweet. I'll just take a page from Mrs. You Savage. I want to thank the community for allowing me to serve uh, for the two terms, uh, eight years. So with that, uh, next up is announcements. So uh, as always stated, we have on our website our various meetings. Uh, Tuesday night, we'll be here. Uh, we're at the Ed Center. Next Tuesday night is uh, the uh, reorg meeting, as it's called, reorganization meeting at the Ed Center. So uh, that is on the website. And with that, looking for a motion to adjourn. Ms. Nyman, uh, second by Mr. Brees, meeting adjourned. <laughs>